Hello, Pathfinders. Welcome to our E honors. Today we're doing red alert. It is a, a level one, skills level one honor in the category health and science. Year of introduction was 1986 by the General Conference. I need you to stay with me because although there's only five requirements, as you will see from your worksheet, it is a packed honor. So when I say the honor is packed, there's a lot of stuff inside this one honor. There's a little bit of first aid in, some CPR, some basic rescue, your basic water safety you need to know, you need to know your basic swimming honor, and you also need to know your knots. And then there's a fire safety honor that was introduced by the General Conference in 2012. And that one is very important. So I need you to stay with me. Before we go any further, I've chosen a verse that fits this honor. There's so many of them. <clears throat> That's so good where God talks to us, telling us, and admonishing us to be alert all the time. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. That's found in Colossians 4 and verse 12. Jesus tells us here, we must keep our minds alert. Another word for alert means awake or wide awake. So our minds at all times need to be awake, we need to be sharp, and we need to have thankful hearts. We must always thank Jesus for everything that we have. As I was working through this honor, I realized just how grateful we as South Africans should be. We don't have tsunamis, we don't have terrible earthquakes as they do in other countries, we don't have hurricanes, we don't have snow avalanches. We don't have volcanoes. We have earthquakes that's far and few, but not nearly as devastating as other parts of the world. So having said that, let us close our eyes and ask God to bless us. Heavenly Father, thank you for sparing our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity that we can come before you and give thanks to you. Thank you, Father, that you have given us alert minds. Help us to develop our minds with your knowledge and help us, Lord, to use it for the betterment of other people. And in this honor, let us apply it to save lives and to help people from becoming injured. Bless each and every pathfinder that's partaking in this campery. Thank you again, Lord, for all your blessings on us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Shall we move on? Requirement number one. It says, what should you do if your house is on fire, your neighbor's house, or a public building? <clears throat> Simple. I've given you all the answers. All right, I'm a nice lady now. Okay, so all your answers are there. I will demonstrate to you only a few of them. All right, number one, stay calm. Number two, alert anyone in the building. And most important, keep in mind, that fire can spread very, very quickly. So it is better for you to call the fire department, number one, call the fire department. Number two, get people out of the building to evacuate. I'm starting you off with homework. I want the number for the local fire department in your area in your area, there's a local fire department. That's what number one of your homework, where we want that phone number. Right, 
Emergency number, call emergency response, 112. I'm helping you with your homework, all right? If there's a fire in your house, a neighbor's house, or a public place, answer is simple. Call emergency response. We have very, very good, um, adequate firefighters that's well trained. If the fire is small, you will extinguish it yourself. Are we clear on this one? Right. This is a mini fire extinguisher, which you keep in your house, you keep in your car. Always good to have it near to the stove. Other than that, you have a fire blanket. <clears throat> it's tiny, it doesn't take a lot of space. It looks like that. It's called an emergency rescue blanket. But this blanket can cover the biggest, tallest, person in your club, small as it is. You wrap this over the fire or throw it over the fire. If you don't have this, then you use a clean blanket. Make sure the blanket is clean. Make sure there's no oil stains on it. Make sure there's nothing flammable on the blanket. The blanket must be clean. The reason why I told you about the fire safety honor, you need to know how to use this thing. There's full instructions on there. There's a little gauge there that tells you how full or how empty it is. All you do is you pull out this thing here when you have to extinguish a fire and a small one like this, you don't need the hose. On the screen, you will see there's a big hose reel, which you find in your schools, in your churches and big office blocks. For the purposes of this exercise, you pull out that one, you push there and the white powder comes out from that little gadget there. Otherwise it would have a tube that comes down if it's for bigger fires. Keep this one at end. Learn how to use it, it's light. And little hands like ours can hold it nice and easily. That's for small fires. When you're testing to see where fire is coming from, always use the back of your hand. Touch the sides of the door, the door frames with the back of the hands. Never like that, to feel where the fire is coming from, to feel if the door frame is hot or not. And then when you touch the handle, again, the back of your hand, do not touch the handle like that because if your hand is burned, you can't do anything or help anyone with that burned hand. So we use the back of the hand. When you know where the fire is coming from and smoke starts to come through, you go down on the floor, flat, 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 and you crawl, okay? Don't be brave. Don't try to run. Flat on the floor and you crawl out. If there's too much smoke, take a wet cloth, a wet tissue, a damp cloth, cover your mouth and your nose. These days, we all use these things. Cover your mouth and your nose to prevent yourself from inhaling smoke. Can we move on? Always have an escape route. This is another part of your homework. I did a simple one there. Make a house plan. You will notice at school and at church, they have that thing that says assembly point. You have to do this yourself as part of your homework. All right, let's carry on. If you are stranded in a car, like I said, we don't have serious blizzards. We don't have um, desert area here in South Africa, but this is what you do. If you're in a car in the desert, find shade. Number one, 
find shade. It's difficult to find shade. Find shade, stay hydrated. If you have water, drink it. Don't spare it for later or for tomorrow. Drink whatever water you have. Keep yourself hydrated. Do not take off your clothes. No matter how hot it gets in the desert, never take off your clothes and stay near to your car. If you stay near to your car, other cars that pass by or other people that pass by will notice you and they will see you. But if you wander away, you can get lost. If you are caught in a blizzard, very simple. Close all the doors and all the windows of the car. Use a little water at a time. Different to the being stuck in the desert, now you only take little sips of water. Right. Do not turn the engine on for more than 10 minutes. Sometimes it's cold and we want to put the heater on and it's a blizzard and we're shivering. So what you do is switch on for 10 minutes and switch off. The danger there is you could inhale carbon monoxide, which is a poisonous gas, and you could suffocate and possibly die, which we don't want. As often as you can, try to clear the snow from the roof and the windows of the car. Now, if you're in a motor vehicle accident, first thing you do, keep calm. Number two, put out your danger triangles, like you see on the screen there. Put on your reflective jacket and call the police or the traffic department for help. At a motor car accident, check if everyone is okay. You yourself need to stay out of the traffic. If you can, move the car to the side. You obviously would have an adult that is driving the car. Position your reflective triangles again and always use your reflective checker. What do you do when you're in an earthquake? Simple, exit the building when the shaking has stopped. An earthquake is when we have that shake and we feel everything go doo -doo 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 and the furniture goes. And sometimes we get scared and they say there's a spook in the house. Ne? Okay, that's not a spook, that's just an earthquake. So when the shaking has stopped, get out of of the house. If you are already outside, stay far from the building and power lines. What are power lines? Some of us that live in informal settlements, you see these power lines that cross on the top where people take electricity and they draw to their shacks. Stay away from those things. They are very dangerous. Beware of aftershock. A lot of people don't go into immediate shock. A few days later, they realize that they have side effects from the shock. Call 112 for any serious problems. Stay away from the mains, gas lines, and water lines. There's more answers for you on what to do in an earthquake. Now, what do you do if you're in a flood? Okay, in a flood, disconnect all appliances. These days, ESCOM switches off for us. Ne? We don't even have to disconnect. Ne? But disconnect all appliances. Switch off the main box in your house so you need to know where the main box is. Fill the tub with running water. Fill a bathtub with running water. Why? It's flooding. And I must fill a bathtub with running water. That seems stupid, eh? It's not stupid. The reason why you fill a bathtub with running water is if you are alone, you can get into the bathtub and you can stay afloat. Do not cross flooded streams. Now, remember, I spoke about your beginner swimming honor and your water safety honor. And this is where it comes in when you're experiencing a flood. 
Float on your back, feet first. Out as the current takes you. Go out with your feet first, on your back, not on your front. Do not be brave and try to swim. Do not try to stand in swift water. When the water from the flood is moving, do not try to stand. Lift yourself, lay on your back, use your arms to guide you against any um, foreign objects that's drifting along that can hurt you. I also spoke to you about your knots. In floods, you're gonna need to know your knots, especially your rescue knots. As many rescue knots as possible, Pathfinders, friends, you did them in helping hand, you're now carrying them over to Pathfinders. Keep your rope, always, always know your rescue knots because they do come in handy, especially your bowline where you need to help someone else and save someone else. What do you do in a tornado? Tornadoes are simple. We don't experience much of them in South Africa, if any at all. However, if you do get into that situation, go to the basement of the building or a storm shelter. Get to the lowest, lowest possible level that you can. Again, flat on the floor. But this time you roll yourself into a ball. You cover your head, something like that. And you roll yourself in a tiny ball and flat on the floor, okay? Stay in a room with windows. Use a mattress to protect yourself. Now I like these days they have, um, these nice blow-up mattresses that we use for camp net. If you have one of those, use it, but otherwise just use a normal light sponge mattress to protect yourself and go and lay under, underneath the mattress. If you're in a hurricane, <clears throat> again, up the shutters, evacuate if possible. Move to high, high ground. Look out for storm. Um, look out for storm lines. Have non-perishable foods and clean water. Non-perishable foods. If you live in a country that this, this is really purely for people who live in a country where they experience hurricanes very often. Non-perishable foods is going to be your baked beans, your tinned fish, your all the food that can't spoil, all the food that can't get rotten. Again, fill the bathtub with water. It's going to come in handy for a whole lot of things. Fill your cars with fuel. We fill up in South Africa before the fuel price goes up. And turn off all electrical appliances. A thunderstorm, yes, South Africa, we do have thunderstorms. And it's, um, it's rather dangerous. So, never lay flat because that's where the thunder will hit you. All your answers are there. I'm going to skip this one because I want you to cut and paste in your worksheet. Um, what do you do if you are in atomic emergency? Now, Atomic, what is at atomic or atomic? It sounds such a big word. Evacuate if possible, get underground if possible. Use potassium or iodate tablets. Cover your nose, mouth and eyes with a cloth. Now men, how do I cover my nose, mouth and eyes? It's easy because you can't cover your nose, mouth, and eyes and expect to see where you go. So we carry these things. 
Remember COVID made screens for us. We have all sorts of screens. So you put your screen on and now you are covered from all those atomic poisons. All right, simple as that. Okay, let's carry on. Snow avalanche, another simple thing. <clears throat> Curl, Curl yourself into a ball. Remember I said face down. Always face down with a heel. Cover your head with your hands again. Always carry a little spade. <clears throat> you don't need a little spade. What you can use for a little spade is a teaspoon or a big spoon. You know the spoons that you dish up food with? You can carry a spoon like that, which doesn't take a lot of space. What do you do when your boat capsizes? Remember your basic water safety honor. Do not go near to water if you cannot swim, number one. All right. Other than all those other things that's, list, that's listed on the top there, remember your basic water safety honor. Do not go near to water. Do not play in water if you cannot swim. If someone else is in trouble, again, use your rope. Stay close to your boat, tie yourself to your boat with your rope using your rescue knots. Making an emergency call. When we make the emergency calls in South Africa, especially to the hospitals, you never hang up until help is next to you. Information to give that's important is your name, your telephone number, the location where you are. Next to location of the emergency, there's two. Something that we overlook to give for a location. When you're riding out with mommy and daddy on a long trip, you'll see on the road there's little square boards and there's white numbers with some letters, maybe an L and some numbers. That is the latitudinal area where you are. And it's the quickest, fastest way for emergency service to locate you. Tell them what the nature of the emergency is. Tell them what the dangers and the injuries are. Again, do not hang up. And if they want to hang up on the other side in the call center, no, ma'am, please, ma'am, please don't hang up. Please, this is a serious emergency, ma'am. The person is, is very, very bad, ma'am, please. I will hang up when the ambulance is right next door to me. Okay. And then we have a video there. Um, can we get to that video, please, Pastor? Yes, here's another information that I think you need to know. I noticed that some people don't know this. If you need an ambulance, you need police or you need fabric aid and you don't have a time, you can simply call the number 112. It's a toll free number. Even if there is no network where you are, it will go through. Please tell your friends to tell their friends. They need this. I realized it. Thank you. Thank you, Pathfinders. Remember that number? 112. Even if you have no network, we all have cell phones. It doesn't matter what type of cell phone you have, use it and dial that number so help can be on your way. Our next slide. What 
first aid, do you need to know if somebody's clothes catch fire? Now, a lot of us are exposed to fires. We do campfires. Some of us live in um, informal settlements and we often see fire. So we always hear the stop, drop and roll, but it's easier said than done. So the process is simple. Stop to think. And before you drop and before you roll, you need to look. That is why you must stop. Otherwise, you're just going to drop and you're going to roll and you will roll in oil or petrol or some sanitizer or hazardous fuels that will cause the fire to aggravate. Or if you roll incorrectly, you can hurt and harm yourself. So you stop and you think. And then before you drop, fold your hands over. If possible, cover your face. And then you roll. Um, let's see if we can if we can demonstrate it here. Right. Am I audible, Pastor? So, stop. Stop. And I'm thinking and I'm looking where I'm going to roll. I'm folding my hand. All right, Pathfinders, this is how you stop, drop, and roll. I've stopped and I'm getting ready to drop, crossing my hands and then I'm dropping face down, covering my face and then I roll, still covering my face. Are we okay with that? Good. All right, Pathfinders, our next requirement says, what first aid do you need to know for treating bleeding or a wound? Number one, clean your hands, we sanitize, all right. Number two, the golden rule for first aid, protect yourself, my safety comes first. So always using gloves, putting them on properly to make sure that they don't tear and telling the person everything is going to be fine. Just keep calm. And then we apply gauze directly onto the wound. Okay. If the cut is there, the gauze goes onto there with the glove band. Always gloves on your hands. Check and see if there's more blood. Don't remove that one. Put more gauze and put pressure. Please will you hold here tight. And then you take your bandage. It can either be a roller bandage which is also known as a pressure bandage. And you apply the bandage nice and tight towards the person's body, okay? And you go tight. Even if it's bleeding, carry on. Carry on with your bandage, even if it's bleeding. Make sure it's tight but not too tight to cut circulation unless the bleeding is severe. Are you okay, ma'am? Is the bandage not too tight? You're fine. Please have it checked out at the hospital. Okay. You must have it checked out. You can't play with it because the scut is fairly deep even if you feel fine, okay? Okay. And then I'm checking 
for circulation to see if it's too tight. There is circulation, so I can carry on and complete the bandage, and then the person can go to the hospital. When you're done with the bleeding, with the bandaging, sorry, pathfinders, and you see they're still bleeding, put the limb upwards. Ask the person to hold their arm in an upward position, okay? Always like that. If it's an arm or a leg, let them hold it like that. Thank you. That's what we do for bleeding and for wounds. Discarding your gloves. Never touch blood or body fluids. Take your gloves off properly. And when you've taken it off, make sure you burn it. Do not put it into a bin. Thank you. Thank you, Grace. if the bandage is snug, but a finger can be slipped under it. Hemostatic dressings are special dressings treated with an agent that helps control bleeding. They can be used to control severe bleeding or bleeding in areas where a tourniquet can't be used. If direct pressure does not control the bleeding and you have a hemostatic dressing, apply it directly on the wound using direct pressure. Six, if appropriate, Treat the person for shock and call 911. A tourniquet can be used when you are unable to control bleeding in a limb using direct pressure or a pressure bandage. Use a commercially made tourniquet if you have one. You can also make a tourniquet using a non-stretch cloth such as a triangular bandage. Let's review the steps to control bleeding with direct pressure one more time. Step one. Put on medical exam gloves or improvised protection if no gloves are available. Step two, place a sterile dressing or clean cloth over the wound or use a hemostatic dressing if needed and one is available. Step three, apply firm pressure directly on the gauze covered wound for about five minutes. Step four, reevaluate the bleeding. So the time needs to go now. Mm -hmm. This is choking.
two, three, four, five. Nothing's come out. So I go in and I do my stomach thrusts. This is done this way. My hands in a fist and I'm gonna pull in and up. Always in and up five times. If that does not help and she gets unconscious, we get ready to do CPR, okay? Always get ready to do CPR. CPR kit, very simple, your gloves and your mouthpiece. That's our mouthpiece. That's our gloves, which we carry in our key ring. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Now let's do baby that's choking. The same with Nana choking. Again, gloves on the hands. Why do we put gloves when baby is choking? Because for babies, we check if there's something inside the mouth. So on with my gloves without tearing them. Shake them out nicely. Tear them nicely. Don't tear them. With Nana, we always work as close to the floor as possible. So I'm checking if there's something in the mouth and I can't see anything. And I'm holding Nana with the head down and the bottoms up and it's five. One, two, three, four, five. And turning Nana nicely over like that. One, two, three, four, five. And if that thing comes out, this is the recovery position for Nana. That's all we do. But always working as close to the floor as possible. Because when babies, when that thing comes out, whatever they're choking with, they kick and they fight and it's easy to lose control. So they don't fall too far and too hard. Thank you. We'll do some more questions on choking later. Choking. Choking is a common emergency. In adults, choking usually happens while eating and with children while they're eating or playing. If the person is coughing and trying to expel the item on their own, don't interrupt. But if the person is in clear distress, clutches their throat, looks frantic, or signals that they're not getting enough air, then it's time to give first aid. Let's take the basic technique step by step. First thing, ask, are you choking? Are you choking? If the person cannot cough, speak, or breathe, quickly ask for consent to give first aid and have someone call 911. Can I help you? One, stand behind the person with one leg forward between their legs to brace yourself. Two, locate the person's navel with a finger from one hand. Three, make a fist with the other hand and place the thumb side of the fist against the person's abdomen just above the navel. Four, grasp your fist with your other hand and thrust inward and upward into the abdomen with a quick motion. Five, keep performing thrusts until the person expels the object or becomes unresponsive. If the person you need to help is someone you can't get your arms around or is pregnant, or when you can't effectively give abdominal thrusts, you can perform chest thrusts on the middle of the breastbone from behind the person. Take care not to squeeze their ribs with your arms. A person who is choking is not breathing and may soon become unresponsive. Hey, are you okay? Have someone call 911 immediately. And get an Lower the unresponsive person to the ground and start CPR by pumping the chest 30 times hard and fast, followed by two breaths. Before giving breaths, check the mouth and remove any object seen. Now it's your turn to practice these techniques. If you're practicing on a partner and not a mannequin, 
Simulate proper abdominal thrusts. Do not perform actual abdominal thrusts. Doing so could injure your partner. Now it's All right, Pathfinders, all good and well to know how to help others when they're choking. If you are alone and you are choking, you must know how to help yourself. So the same way you make your first and in the same position that you would have done it on your partner, you push in and up. Okay, if you have a chair, lean over the chair with this portion of your stomach over the chair, put your hands out as far as possible and pull outward. And that is how you help yourself five times if the object doesn't dislodge the first time. After that is done, please help if yourself checked at the doctor. Thank you. All right, we're moving nice and fast now. Poison, there's different types of poisons. What firstly do you need to know when someone has swallowed poison? We like these things, ne? Please do not use it. Do not make the person vomit. All you do is call your emergency number or take the poison that the person has swallowed, the container, whatever you're suspecting, take it to the hospital or to the ER or to the doctor with you. These days our sanitizers look like water and little children often get thirsty and they swallow it because it may be in a cup or a glass while mommy or da daddy is decanting. So be careful, but take the container along to the hospital with you. Then, other ways of treating poison is a fancy medical term that they call naloxone. It's normally used when people overdose on drugs. You know the naughty ones who OD, ne? We don't OD, ne? We don't even do drugs, ne? So we don't use that. We're not allowed to administer it. Although the Americans strongly recommend it, it is only for trained people. What we do is we use this thing called an EpiPen or epinephrine. And there's a way to use this. You remove this thing here, this blue thing on the top, and in the middle of the thigh, you release the injection. Hard and fast, okay? That's all we do for poisoning. Other than that, there's no negotiation. The person must go to the hospital to have themselves seen to. We'll take some questions on poisoning later on. In case of poison, if the person is responsive, call the poison control center. If the person has signs of a life-threatening condition or is unresponsive, call 911. Put any breathing unresponsive person in the recovery position. In some cases, accidental poisoning is easy to recognize and treat. In others, you have to be alert and know the signs and symptoms. These include nausea and vomiting, abdominal pain or cramps, drowsiness, dizziness, or disorientation and changing levels of responsiveness. Hey, Grandma, did you take your medicine today yet? Oh, I forgot. Okay, I'll get it for you. Thank you. Here you go. Okay. All right, I'm out of here. I love you. I'll see you later, okay? Oh, okay, honey. Get to take your pills with your milk, Grammy. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Hey, 
Did you take your medicine today yet? Oh, I forgot. Oh, that's okay. I'll get it for you. Thank you. Okay. Here you are. Thank you. I love that book. Really interesting. Mm -hmm. Mom, are you feeling okay? A little dizzy. Hold on, you don't look so good. Tell me what you've eaten today and drank so far. I had a little sandwich. I a little juice. And Mark gave me my pills. Mom, I gave you your pills today. Did you get pills from Mark or Selena? If you did, that means you had two doses. Mom, could you have gotten pills from both of them? I don't remember. I don't remember. Well, we're not going to take any chances. I'm going to call the poison control center. In cases of inhaled poisons rather than ingested poisons, you might observe headache, dizziness, nausea or vomiting, signs of chest pain, convulsions, or changing levels of responsiveness. The first aid for inhaled poison is similar to the steps you take in the case of ingested poison. First, move the person into fresh air. Next, even if the person starts to recover, call 911 and stay with the person until help arrives. Put an unresponsive breathing person into the recovery position and loosen tight clothing around their neck or chest. If you suspect that a person is experiencing an opioid drug overdose, a drug called naloxone can save the person's life. Naloxone can be administered by rescuers using an auto injector or an intranasal kit. If you suspect an opioid drug overdose, call 911 and administer naloxone if it is available and you are permitted to do so by state law. Be prepared to start CPR if needed. There's a simple rule of thumb on when to call the plane. Three position. The recovery position is the safest and most stable position for many emergency situations. It allows the person to breathe, permits fluids to drain from the mouth, and prevents stomach contents from blocking the airway or being inhaled in case of vomiting. You're going to use the recovery position for any person who is breathing and unresponsive, as long as you do not suspect a neck, back, hip, or pelvic injury. Let's take a look at how to get someone into recovery position. Watch each step carefully. The whole procedure takes place in a few easy fluid movements. One, cross the victim's far arm over the chest. Two, grasping the shoulder and hip Carefully roll the victim's body towards you until the victim is on her side. Her head should rest on her arm. Three, bend both legs so the victim's position is stabilized. Four, with the victim now in position, open the mouth to allow drainage and monitor breathing. You see, it's easy once you've seen it done. Now it's your turn to practice. All right, now it's our turn, Pathfinders, to practice recovery position. 
Das hand closest to you, move it up. Kneel as close to the body as possible for two reasons. You don't hurt your back. And if you roll the person over, you don't fall over with the person. Never roll away from yourself, always to yourself. Take this hand, put under the, under the cheek there, and then I'm grabbing on the clothes by the shoulder and on the hip, and I'm pulling nice and easy. Always cover the person and make sure they're comfortable. All right, take that hand, put it like that. Open the airway and check for fluids. If necessary, keep them warm. Reassure them that help is coming and they will be okay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. All right, Pathfinders, thank you very much. We've done most of our practicals, or about all of our practicals. Um, coming to a close, you will notice when we started this presentation, they ending it pretty much the same way as they started. How to get people out of a building that is burning. Know where your assembly point is. Practice your fire drills. Keep calm. Tap people who panic on the shoulder. You know, I, we like to panic now. Keep calm. And if people go, tap them on the shoulder, say, be calm, be calm. Neatly walk out this way. All right. Be careful of a stampede. Ask bigger people and stronger people to help you. I like people who bully on this one because they have that power to say, listen here, behave yourself and walk nicely. Otherwise, everyone is going to get hurt. So even bullies have their place, although we don't like bullying eh? and we don't encourage bullying. Eh? But those persons that's got stronger characters, use them. Always practice your fire drill at home, at church, at school. Very important. Make sure you have an assembly point at your church and get people to walk out of the building calmly. Again, more homework. Know your fire drill and know your plan and your escape routes and your assembly point. Right. Back to this one, fire, 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 know how to use it. Abduction. Pathfinder's abduction has become very serious in South Africa and not just in South Africa, maybe all around the world, but more so these days. And I need for you to take it very seriously. This thing requires a lot of prayer, not just for us, but for our friends. We so often hear it's almost daily on the news, on the social networks. You see reports of missing children and um, adults go missing too. Previously, it used to happen mostly where girls are being abducted. Today, it's different. Boys get abducted as much as girls. Men are being abducted, women are being abducted, old people and young people equally are being abducted. Body parts are being sold for multi murders and they sell body parts on the black market um, at a lot, a lot, a lot of money. Life has become cheap and Jesus needs us to look out for each other and to know the dangers. Even when you're with adults, make sure you are with adults that you can trust. Most times people who abduct you or people who would abuse you are people who you know. 
and people that's very close to you. So if somebody, an adult touches you in, in not to a nice way, regardless of whether you're a boy or a girl, don't be scared to report it. Tell someone big. If you're walking home from school or if you're walking home from club and there's a car that's following you and somebody tries to grab you, scream, fire, fire, fire and run in an opposite direction to the direction that the vehicle is traveling in that wants to abduct you. Report it immediately, whether you know the person or whether you don't know the person, you must report it. It's your God-given responsibility to report any act of abduction. It is very, very serious. Parents, let your parents always know where you are. Always keep your mobile phone with you. And if you're running late, if you have to be in detention, if you're staying a bit late at club, tell mommy, daddy, auntie, uncle, or someone that you're late, they don't need to worry but always tell, look after yourself. Always keep your GPS signal on your mobile device. All of us have these things, ne? it's not just for social networks, ne? there's other uses for them, please use them. Make sure mommy and daddy knows what clothes you're wearing when you leave home and make sure you know what they are wearing. If they leave before you or after you, it's either you in your school uniform or you in your Pathfinder uniform or whatever play clothes you in. Mommy and daddy, take a screenshot, send it to your child, say, hi, this is how I look today. If anything goes missing, it's easy for them and it's easy for you to be identified. So let's be serious about that. Then there's a nice song that we do at the CPCs. Uncle, if you touch me inappropriately, I will call the police. They will come with a siren and handcuff you and you will be arrested. So look after yourself, look after your friends, and let's thank Jesus for having looked after us all this time. We'll see you later when it's questions and answers. For now, we're going to ask Auntie Blessed to give us a closing prayer. Let's close our eyes as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we'd like to thank you for the just the topic that you've given to us. Thank you for the lesson that we, you have given unto us, for the knowledge that has been impacted. I will pray, Lord, that we are going to put it into practice. May it help us and also may it save lives. As we continue in the ministry, as we continue in the temporary, we pray that we'll be with us. Whatever we do, may it give glory unto you. When all has been done and said, may we make it to your kingdom. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.